Oh, well, lots of really interesting things there. Um, I guess I was particularly interested in those aspects around thinking about self-determination and independent peoples and how, um, yeah, the, 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 the kind of up and down nature between national peoples in mm. relation to that. So, you know, with, with those, I mean, one of the, one of the discussions um, that, that I know people have had is, is how, how a, a state, um, you know, is it just about leaving space? Um, what role does a state have in the self-determination of the just in terms of, of you know, running to the time? The state, in that context, you talked you talk about le leaving space for um, Maori to establish those uh, community checkpoints themselves. But there's, is there something more that the state needs to do than just get out of the way? I, I think so. Um, so I think in some circumstances it is just a function of the state moving out and that's, and that's enough, this sort of passive, negative thing of letting indigenous peoples um, regulate. But I think the state has to actually in some um, uh, cases kind of, and, and, well I guess they are relinquishing authority in some ways by saying, and, but I think there has to be a more positive act to, to step back and say we don't have authority to um, and take away jurisdiction sorry, take away their own jurisdiction or not exercise any jurisdiction um, in places where the state had exercised jurisdiction previously. I mean, with COVID was quite new, I guess, so that, that maybe facilitated this um, because it wasn't a space that the government was... Well, I mean, there were laws on the books, but, but was using... It was a relatively new situation. Um, but I do think to realise sanitaritanga and self-determination that it is important that the state relinquish authority too. And also there has to be a negotiation at some point between Māori authority and state authority as to how they work together to on, in spaces of joint jurisdiction um, as well. Um, and I think that's, that's happening in some ad hoc ways, that discussion that we had actually with the, um, yeah, about the small c. But I think it has to happen in a, in a, in a uh, really constitutional way as well, in a very significant way. Um, not just in a state stepping back in incremental change. Yeah. And, and sorry, just to follow up, maybe put Tracy and others into this as well. So, in, so international instruments like UNDRIP, they provide mechanisms to support the state to do that? or I mean, I think they provide a greater... A, a, the normative framework for that to happen, I mean, the declaration doesn't have a lot of practical handles. It's really up to communities in the state to work that out. But I think it definitely supports the guarantees in Tetiriti or Waitangi and then Māori rights more generally for this to occur. And just to also add to the point that, yes, if the state, I think the state has a positive obligation not only to with. I don't know if withdraw is the right word, I don't know what the other word is, but you know, like not be there, um, but to also provide support because particularly in emergency contexts, there's so much need and it needs to happen quickly and the government, the state has those resources at hand, so why would it not, um, what my argument is it's obligated to, to use those resources in the best way possible and one of those ways is to support tikanga Māori. self-determination and, and because in some Latin American countries uh, what, I ha what has happened is that uh, original peoples have been left uh, alone. Mm -hmm. So this is this will be kind of the downside of uh, self-determination. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this? Uh, this is an opportunity for some governments to say, okay, this is your, this is, uh, your affair and, and uh, we don't care too much about you. Know. Yeah, it happens in really, really not just in Latin America, it happens in other places in, in, in the world as well with, res with respect to indigenous peoples. Um, so that states will have obligations under the declaration to that are beyond self-determination which relate to 
um, health, which relate to education, which relate to um, social and economic um, issues and culture and so on. So um, those obligations are still there. So it's so I think in terms so the Navajo is actually not a bad bad example, right? Um, because of the colonial of the, the impact of colonization, you have you have a peoples that, that are um, very poor and you've got very poor funding of um, the Navajo Nation, who also then exercises self determination and has their own governments, makes their own laws, has their own courts, has their own their own enforcement mechanisms as well. Um, so it's a balance between trying to support and ensure that you've got um, sufficient, I guess, socio-economic support at the same time as, as staying out. So it's a, it's, a, it's a balance to be to be struck. In some cases in Latin America, sure, there are, there are also peoples who are actually in voluntary isolation. We don't want the state to, and then I think the state should stay completely out. And that is the policy of the of the United Nations, more or less, to to, to leave peoples and peoples who are I think, what's what's the, what's the name? I think peoples who have never been discovered and who literally live free of pretty much the outside world. Um, and I think that's important to, to respect that if that's what Indigenous peoples are thinking. Mm. I mean, I think at all, at all times, you, Indigenous peoples are the ones who should be interpreting and letting the state know. But it is a problem that, um, and you see that in treaty settlements here, is treaty settlements fundamentally about the state saying, OK, we've, we've pride, provided reparations, state out now. Māori, you're now sort of you've got the money to to become a capitalist kind of peoples and, and, and make money and participate. Um, so stayed out, or is that just part of an ongoing um, relationship building? I mean, Carwin's written at length about this. So you know that dynamic about state in, state out. Is it state absconding itself, or you know, relieving itself of, of all responsibility, or um, giving space? So that that's always going to be. A balance, and it, and it is in, in every state in different ways. It's not just in it's here as much as it is in in, in the Americas. In fact, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for such a great panel. Um, I'd love to have you guys just talk about no, uh, Dylan. I've got a question for you. I've got lots of questions for you, so I'm a couple. You can pick what you want to answer. But I love um, the way that you frame. Um, the idea of this 30 year experiment um, and it's time to come back and revisit it. And I guess a couple of different things going on. Um, one is, is it enough for us to bring economic, social, and cultural rights into the NZ4 framework or do we need to change that framework itself? And is it enough just to bring in the economic, social, and cultural rights or are there actually other bodies of rights that we need to be thinking about too if we're really trying to aim for this transformational change? that you're interested in, and James will me, so I'll stop the questions there, but I really, I think that there's so much in this, so I'm super excited to talk more. Um, yeah, those are really important and um, big questions. I'm not too sure if I have anything <laughs> useful to say right now. Um, but in terms of what more needs to be done, I don't see it as like... Um, the solution that I'm kind of looking for uh, to address inequity, I kind of see it as... Um, interested in what um, my um, Māori um, colleagues have to say, but I kind of see it as a stepping stone towards um, a tertiary um, based constitution, which I think is the ultimate goal. Um, in my opinion, um, for me, I see um, the rights of Pasifika kind of um, more protected in that sort of arrangement. Um, but I'm kind of thinking of this, while we're in this heavy colonial framework, that that's a bit more. The word that comes to mind is tangible, but I don't want to use that word. But like, a bit more possible with what what's happening. Um, so, yeah, I don't see it as a civil. But there's so many issues with it. Um, but I, I'm kind of just in that space of just looking for anything really to kind of um, address poverty and to find better ways to hold the government accountable for failing to address um, poverty time and time again. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Just to pick up on, on Anna's point, one of the things that um, struck me was about migrant workers' rights. Yeah. And, and we have such few protections here, and if we look at the history of colonial exploitation, say, 
example, and the Lisa case and so on, there's, there's a whole pile of constitutional issues there that relate to, to treaty arguments as well. And I think that, that reconceptualization of rights um, in, infused by both critical race theory and, and decolonization theory provide a fertile COVID-based kind of, um, well, COVID provides a context for, for exploring some of those relationships. Ken, did I see your hand go up? I, I, thanks, yes. I was just going to make the point in, uh, about Article 3, because it quite often gets forgotten. And, you know, there's that very important um, paper that Aparanda Nata wrote in about 1920, in which he insisted on the protections of Article 3. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, after all, that gives all of us in the country the same rights and obligations. Um, obligations in English, in, in the translation from Maori, it's rights and privileges, isn't it? Which is slightly odd. Um, but but Article 3 is critical, and, and Nata actually related it to the possible invasion of um, Japan of New Zealand, you know, in terms of the obligations of the Crown. <clears throat> but the, the other point I was going to make about, all, about those sort of issues is that if you go back to Chapter 3 of the report of the Royal Commission on the Electoral System, 1986, you'll find a, rec a very strong recommendation there that says that mm. these matters of the constitutional position of the treaty and of Maori rights under the treaty have to be addressed in a systematic way. And that really hasn't happened. It sort of happened, you know, in terms of that deal between um, the John Key government and the, and the Maori party, but it didn't really, you know, that was never going to get anywhere, that particular uh, constitutional mm. effort. Mm. And and so there is still that thing there. And, and I was reading the book, by, the new book about the Maori Anglican Church by, by one of the cars. Yeah, and, and, and it's got really interesting stuff about the commission that sat in the late 80s. Yeah. Um, and that um, bicultural commission actually used the term social contract in terms of uh, the, uh, tre the treaty relationship between the Crown and the Maori. And, that's an ongoing social contract. You know, that was the terminolo terminology used by the Commission, picking it up from Eddie, I think, in the um, Motunui case, I think. So, so there's, a, there's a lot from further back that can be drawn on in terms of these arguments. Absolutely. I think when it comes to um, Tino Rangatira, Tane Māori have been making the same arguments one form or other. Sense. Yeah. I remember all the notices though on the footpaths around the university, the treaty yeah. is a fraud. Well that's right, <laughs> yeah, I mean so David... Yeah. Uh, so, well, Williams, there, there was actually a banner that said the treaty is a fraud. <laughs> 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 um, very last um, question from Michelle because we are then going to do a transition of the next team on gender, human rights uh, and health. Uh, over to there, so we, because that's where the cameras are trained. Sure. sure. And let Patrick finish for, actually it's for you Patrick. And <laughs> you freeze the uh, pandemic as a uh, catalyst for the reset in Pacific Island yeah. countries. And could you please let us know what what do you think would be the destination or direction to of that reset? Yeah, so, um, that is, and it's, I mean, this is just an allegation and that needs something which needs real investigation, yeah? So is, is the idea of, and this has been voiced not by me because it wouldn't be for me to voice, but actually for Matai living in New Zealand, is especially in regard to uh, Samoa that, that reset into incorporating a, st a stronger voice of custom in the constitution actually is used by the elite uh, to preserve their privileges. And in the Small States Conference we, uh, 10 days ago, there was a colleague from Leiden who has done some work in Africa around this. Uh, coming up was actually exa the same kind of observation that in certain countries at least, custom and traditional leaders have abused the, the use of stronger use of custom to actually preserve privileges rather than what it was actually before. And one of the research projects we are looking at, because one of the big question here also is, what custom are we talking about? And if you look at domestic violence, for example, in Samoa, the, there is the idea that, especially 
pre-missionaries, women, you know, like the, the villagers themselves, but the women had a very strong uh, say and so domestic violence wasn't as prevalent, but it needs to be ascertained somehow what is this custom and then probably judges need to be trained how to use this custom. And one thing we were thinking about is actually looking at Marmory's work on, on the um, dictionary and then every every and the collection of what has been done, Mamori have done to basically to ascertain their 